Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Welcome to this second day of our World Forum on uh, the Circular Economy. We are here in uh, Canada's largest city, Toronto, in the province of Ontario once again. Toronto was founded on the traditional tra territory of many peoples, including the Credit Mississaugas, the Anishinaabek, and the Haudenosaunees and the Wendats. Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And although we're here in Toronto today, Toronto is not home to either of us either. En effet, Catherine. Um, Indeed, Catherine, I come from Calgary, a city based on Treaty Number 7 lands that recognize the supremacy of uh, the Picani and other First Nations who named the territory. The territory had many different names in indigenous country, in indigenous languages. Calgary is also in um, the historic Métis Northwest Territory. Calgary is a city that is really uh, close to my heart in a way that's difficult to express. And I thank all the guardians of this earth that came before me uh, that allowed me to refer to this country as being my home. There you go, Catherine. In the province of British Columbia on the west coast, and there are many, many First Nations that call uh, the province, the territories that are known as BC home. I live in Vancouver on the territories of the Musqueam, the tsleil and the Squamish people. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, my gratitude at being able to be uh, in place uh, on that land to, to learn and to live and uh, to have great respect for what's happened before and what continues to this day. We have another full day of insights and inspiration for you. We have had so many visitors to the site from all over the world, and we're very grateful to have so many of you rejoining us today. Let's take a look now at what happened yesterday. And we have a really unique way to sort of tap back into yesterday's discussions and ideas. Alina Gutierrez is a graphic facilitator, and there she is in all of her glory. And she has spent a lot of time working working to try to capture in words and in images some of what happened over the last day. Merci beaucoup pour votre présence parmi nous, Alina. Thank you very much for being with us, Alina. Uh, and so, Alina, can you give us a little uh, uh, overview of your uh, uh, visual uh, description of uh, our uh, uh, forum? And uh, here uh, I... Uh, I'm uh, uh, showing myself at work. I like to, t like to take uh, pictures uh, and uh, note uh, everything that happens. As we used to look at circular economy, there are main themes that came up again and again, leaving us a really clear call for action. Um, that, um, you know, we cannot do it alone, that even though we have pushed our system past the breaking point, uh, there's stuff that we can do. Uh, ça commence chez nous. On peut prendre des petits pas pour uh, faire vraiment une différence, mais il faut agir dès maintenant. Uh, so this is a uh, representation of all the things that we want to do. Uh, things that we can do, we can start a uh, call for change of policy and we can do small changes at home and talk to others about it so we can really make a difference. Wow, c'est pas mal incroyable, c'est pas mal. It's, it's great, it's unbelievable what you've done. Uh, uh, Catherine, uh, anything to say? come up again and again and how many times they, they sort of resonate in land. In the bottom you mentioned that we need to change from our current linear way of life and that implied circle. W w as somebody who's sort of participating and trying to capture these ideas, where do you see the circle beginning for you and how do you plan to move away from linear and toward a more circular um, in your own life, Lena? 
I think I think as as I said, it starts at home. So uh, it was empowering to hear that that even as a small citizen, as a, just one person, I can make the difference. Um, I also heard, you know, for uh, youth voices, it was really empowering at the end of the day when someone said, you know, you're not the leaders of the future, you're the leaders of today. And as a mom of two young uh, boys, I think it can make a difference starting the conversation early on and trying to make them aware of the difference that we can make as individuals. Right. Amazing. And so as we get ready to dive into day two, what questions did yesterday leave you with? Oh my God, so many questions. <laughs> um, you know, uh, when they spoke about behavior change and innovation, it's something that is hard to move on. Uh, there's stuff that we grew up with and that we've been doing for so long that is ingrained. So how to become aware of those things that I'm doing that are not helping our mother earth and that are not helping, uh, you know, the future for us and for our kids so uh, to, to start being aware of those things so I can look for solutions so my question is how to be aware and why are the little steps that I can start taking that would help me you know small little by little create a ripple effect we all need to have that little thought bubble in our head okay what is this what am I doing and how is this a circular move mm -hmm. Alina thank you so much we look forward to connecting with you again later today and thank you for inspiring us with your work Merci à vous, une très belle journée. Okay. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Inger Andersen, the Undersecretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program. Ms. Andersen is going to give a keynote on why now is a pivotal moment for global econo economies, societies, and for the planet. Thank you so very much. And let me start by thanking um, everyone for organizing this. Of course, our hosts in Canada and uh, through Minister Wilkins, whom I thank to the government and the people of Canada for taking real leadership, stepping in, stepping up on the circular economy agenda. Allow me also to thank other ministers who have been speaking and who will speak in this important session, uh, not least the president of COP25. Minister Schmidt, who's, who I see on my screen right before me. Look, the work that we do, and the work that you do really matters because our planet needs circularity probably more than it has ever done before. This year brought the pictures before us, the intensification of the climate crisis, wildfires consuming entire forests and communities, floods sweeping away villages and turning cities into lakes. Droughts hitting multiple locations, including North America. In July, the Palmer Drought Index said that 37% of the contiguous U.S. was affected by severe to extreme drought. And from where I sit, Nairobi, Kenya, on the beautiful African continent, the headquarters of the United Nations Environment Programme, we have seen this play out in terms of locusts, infestations, in terms of droughts, and indeed in terms of floods. So more intense floods, more intense droughts and storms, exactly what climate scientists have been warning us about for decades, and exactly what IPCC told us just this August, and exactly what we can expect more of and soon if we don't rapidly cut out greenhouse gas emissions. But climate change is not our only concern. Humanity stands and is expanding into wild spaces to feed, to house, and to clothe ourselves, chipping away at the very foundations of what makes life possible, causing nature and biodiversity to be in crisis. Humanity at the same time are poisoning the air, the land and the water with toxic gases, plastics, pesticides, and waste of all kind causing pollution and waste. So we are dealing with this triple planetary crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity and nature crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. And it would be a mistake to consider these crises as separate. They are closely interlinked and interlined with feedback from one spilling over into the other and impacting. They affect each other and are made worse 
by the same drivers that are causing them. And the core drivers of the triple planetary crisis is unsustainable consumption and production. Because for far too long, we have assumed that the planet would keep on giving, that it could absorb whatever punishment we threw at it, that we could emit, pave over, extract, excavate, and cause effluent into uh, our one and only home, and that it would remain predictable that season would follow season, that our migratory species would come as expected, that familiar bird song would arrive when it is the season's turn, that insects would pollinate, and that birds would spread our seeds, that weather patterns would follow those of our grandmothers and grandfathers, and that we thought we could rely on, but we were wrong. We now know we are wrong, and yet, here we are making the same mistakes. It's far beyond the time to move to circular economic models to fix this. So friends, as I mentioned, the science has been telling us for years with new research coming out with ever greater precision about this point. And particularly relevant, obviously, the IPCC's warning in uh, just last August, and also, obviously, the 2021 Circularity Gap Report. This report is a milestone and an important element that shows us what is happening and what is doable. We know that making economies circular would unlock 4.5 trillion of economic growth and possibility and new jobs, yet the world is actually, actually less circular now than it was just a few years ago. So circularity matters. It's good for the planet. It's good for our economy. It's good for nature. It's good for climate and for a cleaner and less polluted world. And I'm sure that many people at this event could list dozens of examples of positive benefits of circularity. The science has told us, but reminding each other of these things, of the things we already know, it's just not going to help get the job done. We need to take this message out and start advocating for the changes we need. And the way we at UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, see it, there are four game changers that can accelerate the circularity transition, the trans circularity transition right now. The first is to make sustainable consumption and production and circularity much more central in the critical multilateral negotiations that are happening in the coming months. The next climate COP, the next biodiversity COP. These will agree on significant agreements around climate change and around protecting biodiversity. The next United Nations Environment Assembly scheduled here in Nairobi in February and March next year. The next meeting on the global framework on the management of sound chemicals. In each of these settings, circularity will greatly increase the chances of success in these crucial processes. So we, the audience, need to bring this into these settings. That's my first point. The second point is to promote shifts in politics in governance, in regulations, in infrastructure, in investment and business models towards that just and informed transition for circularity. For example, obviously, we have spent so much on the pandemic recovery, and rightly so, creating jobs and opportunities and get the economic wheels turning. But let us make sure that we spend this towards circularity and spend it towards sustainability. And that is not what we have done up until now. We have only funded about 21% of that money has gone to spending green. And I wouldn't even be sure that that definition is totally in, in, in link with circular definitions. Or to give an example, um, in corporate circularity in government, we could really incorporate circularity uh, in government procurement decisions. And government procurement decisions represents in OECD countries 12% of GDP, and in many developing countries up to 30%. So imagine what that lever could shift. So we need to, my second point, promoting these shifts in our policies. And the third is to make some fundamental transformation of the economic and the financial systems 
to power that shift to circularity, put a price on carbon, redirect harmful subsidies, shift taxation from production and labor to resource use and waste, set incentives and fiscal measures to reduce the use of new materials for construction and to drive construction and building industry towards circularity, scale up circular economy, uh, financial products and services, and obviously building on existing proofs of concepts. We really can make this happen with government guardrails along the line with the financial system leaving in. And fourth, we need to invest in innovation, in imagination, as well as knowledge, skills, training, to ensure that we have the labor force with access to creative and decent and safe and attractive jobs in, across that new circular economy. And that means retraining architects, urban planners, engineers across the board towards circularity. It also means a total rethinking of how we live, each one of us produce and consume because two thirds of all CO2 emissions emanate from households. But it also means developing opportunities within and recycling and upcycling and offering maintenance services and finding way to support that shift in countries and in industries that rely heavily on linear models. So dear friends and excellencies, this is what we have to do. Because linear economies that take, make, and waste are frankly slowly killing our planet. They're driving the three planetary crises of climate change, of biodiversity, and of pollution. And these crises are slowly killing us. So circular models, on the other hand, can put humanity back into harmony with nature. Because nature itself is circular. They can allow opportunities for a better life for everyone. They can slow and reverse the triple planetary crisis while creating opportunities and jobs with equity. They are fundamentally the only way that humanity can thrive and prosper on this planet for centuries to come. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Manstak Inger. Yeah, I'm well glad that we had the pleasure of listening to you. Um, there was so much that you touched upon, so much that you sort of shared with us, and we're going to be entering into a panel to further discuss and further sort of, comment um, on français, décortiquer toutes les idées. So we're going to start a panel now to discuss and uh, the various e ideas you've uh, uh, mentioned. Full panel joining us uh, once again, Citra President Yerki Katainen, Chile's Minister of Environment, Carolina Schmidt, and the Netherlands Minister for the Environment, Stefan van Weinberg. Bonjour, hello. Thank you for joining us for such an important conversation. Um, I guess we'll be starting with Mr. Katainen. My first question for you, uh, Ms. Uh, Anderson referred to our three major environmental crises of biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution. How does CITRA reflect this urgent call to action in its work? Bonjour, Jacques. Ça va? Et merci beaucoup pour la question. Thank you very much for the question. I fully understand Inger's point, and I agree everything what she said. To follow up on that, I, I'd like to bring out a few key perspectives from Citrusburg. First, these crises are clearly interlinked. Pollution, overconsumption of natural resources, and climate change are all major drivers of biodiversity loss. And pollution intensifies climate change. We cannot treat these crises separately, but they need to tackle them all together. Secondly, it's very important to discuss how the market economy can produce more nature. How can it be harnessed to reduce emissions so that we can live within planetary boundaries? Citra's sustainability work is highly related to that question. Even though this development is in its infancy, we can already see encouraging examples of pioneering businesses where financial success goes hand in hand with the balance, uh, with balance, uh, with balance with nature. And thirdly, 
Citra is a future-oriented organization, which basically means that we seek for solutions that support building a future that is in balance with Earth's carrying capacity. We work on different levels uh, closely with our stakeholders. We work with decision makers, the private sector, and citizens for nature-positive society. We have worked closely on defining a good life within the planetary boundaries and on what motivational factors impact the decisions individuals make. To scale sustainable lifestyles globally, we have, for example, recently launched a global community called Shift 1.5 for co-creating tools that motivate individuals to adopt sustainable lifestyles that fit their everyday life and environment. Back to you, Shaka. Kitos. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to you next, Minister Van Weinberg. Please allow me to congratulate you on your new post and welcome you to the WCEF stage. Uh, I know that your ministry hosted the WCEF Plus Climate in April, and at that conference it was made clear how circularity can be a tool for tackling the climate crisis. Can I get you to expand on that a little bit more and perhaps share what's coming next in terms of that sort of thinking and that direct addressing of the climate crisis? Yes, thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'm happy to take over for my piece as well as to talk about the conversation from other regards. And when we hosted the event in April, the main theme was let's keep the government going. And I think that uh, the words of somebody like you know, Anderson make sure that it's not beyond the time to talk about something. It's about time to actually make that. And uh, quite often that's more easily said than done. And, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Canada, together with the Citra uh, Fund, uh, are now officially hosting this uh, region on the uh, um, WCF Plus. Um, in my opinion, was the main theme uh, in April was that we have to move from action, from, from, from plans and from ideas to action. How do we make sure that it's not just our ideas and it's also our needs? Let me make sure that we didn't change uh, the world because it's not longer than before 12. I think it's at least one hour past 12 and we're about to actually take action. Um, so, uh, for example, I'm very happy with the CDA uh, action plan, which uh, we'll uh, discuss uh, later, so I congratulate the previous speaker. Um, let me say from the Netherlands that I think at least three points we could ask after the meeting. The first one we are developing a toolkit together with the UNED. And our business is in the great sector to turn it into their agencies. We really translate them into action plans. Go from words to practice. And the second is that we have launched this summer the impact of the ICT sector, a sector where repair, reuse, small footprint is not a very long way to go. And finally, together with the Gold Diploma Forum, we are selling some partnerships with micro great sectors. For example, we are enhancing public procurement, and I think we can have some stress that by procurement, because there are various documents we have to do ourselves. And to use for procurement, for example, the transition of this steel and cement industry, which are, have a long way to go, I think, to the economy. So we are looking uh, forward to that today, which mm -hmm. there's no future without history. So maybe this is the time for very brief. Uh, Thank okay. you all. This is WCEF Plus Climate, the World Circular Economy Forum. We need to design for a better future right from the start. 180,000 new green jobs in the booming recycle industry. There's actually only one concept you need to remember, and that is we need to learn to live within planetary boundaries. Would you join us? Not only join, but the United Nations is determined to lead. You first. Okay, wow.
Yeah, lots, lots there, and um, well, you might have experienced some technical difficulties. We're trying to get to the bottom of this to make sure because we don't want you to miss a moment of what Minister Van Weinberg has to say. So right now, I believe, Chuk, you're going to go to Minister Smith, and then we're going to deal with our technical challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to highlight how incredible the WCF Plus Climate um, Conference was um, in, the, in the Netherlands. It was the first uh, WCF conference that was fully online. So that was really exciting to witness and to check out. So with that in mind, Minister Schmidt, let's talk about WCF a little bit more. Uh, you are a veteran of the WCF stage and a tireless advocate for the circular economy. In fact, I heard that this is your second circular economy event today, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is wild to me. So this morning, um, and when I say morning, I'm talking about like morning for someone else, for us who are asleep, uh, you attended the very first high-level meeting of the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency. What is next on the world's agenda for climate biodiversity and circularity? And how can we ensure that everyone, regardless of race, gender, creed, ethnicity, nationality, et cetera, sort of really benefits from the circular economy that, that hopefully we're able to create as a global society? Mr. Schmidt. Well, thank you. Well, let's keep the drum beating, uh, as was the video uh, saying. Effectively, this is our second uh, meeting today on global uh, economy. We were in the panel of GASER, the high level meeting. And I am very glad to be here again because I think it's very good news to see so much action around circular economy. Perhaps I should start by telling the audience a little bit about GASER and why it's so important. This Global Alliance for Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency, GASER, convinced governments from around the world. We share the panel today with environment ministers of India, Japan, South Korea, and Morocco to take concrete actions to foster the transformation to a circular economy at a global scale. The transition to circularity is something no country can do on its own. As an example, in Chile, we import almost all the electronic products we use. If global companies do not make their products more durable or repairable, we cannot make magic to move towards circularity in our multilateral agenda. It must also be a multilateral agenda because circular economy is closely tied to key global, urgent, and interlinked challenges, as it was said before. One of them is climate change. And as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has estimated an energy transition to renewable resources will only address for 55% of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we require to be carbon neutral. But the other 45% must only be achieved by changing the way we produce and consume. Thus, we will not achieve carbon neutrality unless we embrace an ambitious transformation towards a circular economy. In Chile, we have been pioneer country in making this connection clear by including a circular economy component in our updated NDC with concrete commitments such as developing a national circular economy roadmap that we launched last week. As president of COP25, I have made a call to all countries to follow suit and hope to see this link very high in the agenda again in the upcoming COP26. What is powerful about this connection is that we can measure if the greenhouse gas emission of different activities and sectors and quantitative contribution of the transition to a circular economy. The other global challenge is biodiversity loss. At COP25, we promote the integration to the climate and biodiversity agendas. Indeed, COP25 was the blue COP because of the importance we gave to oceans, which make up two thirds of planets and are key for mitigation and adaptation. Here, we have also hard data that allowed us to make this link clear. We cannot manage what we do if we do not measure it. So this is a key for integrating agendas. Now, how we do connect all of these three agendas, climate change, biodiversity loss, and circular economy, 
in order to achieve a common objective to guarantee sustainability and development in the place and the planet, the only planet that we have. I think the Dasgupta report offer a vision of the future. It tells us that our economies do not only depend on human capital, I would say health, knowledge and skills, and physical capital like roads, buildings and factories, but also on natural capital. We need natural capital stocks, he says, to produce flows of wealth. This is why we are part of a global alliance to protect 30% of our territorial and marine ecosystems. The Dasgupta report also allowed us to economically quantify the relevance of safeguarding a stock of our natural capital in order to guarantee productivity in a way that it does not affect the sustainability of our development. As the report points out, this is not just a market failure, but a much broader institutional failure as we lack of institutional arrangements necessary to protect global public goods such as the world's oceans and rainforests. It is critical that international and private financial institutions, governments and central banks came together to build a financial system that protects biodiversity and encourages sustainable consumption and production. In Chile, we are indeed working hand in hand with the central bank, with our central bank to measure our country progress in a more integral way. Finally, to your question on how to ensure everybody's benefit from circular economy, the linear economy is a major generator of the most waste because they consume the more. And those who suffer from its impacts are, you know, the landfills and illegal dumping are the most vulnerable people. So circular economy needs to be seen as a way also to reduce those inequalities. Understanding that circular economy is a collaborative economy. The waste of some, you know, industries is an, is an input for others. We need to work together. So the way that we create green jobs, the way we create innovation, the way we reduce our emissions are in this transition that includes everybody leaving no one behind. Minister Smith, thank you so much for your thoughts this morning. And it's um, a good way for us to build. Of course, we're going to be hearing from Professor Dasgupta in just a few moments. But right now, I'd like to turn uh, back to Mr. Katainen. Can you build somewhat on what Minister Smith has just told us? What momentum are you seeing now start to build uh, globally from your position there at Citra? And what role do you see these various alliances playing in, in fulfilling that new vision? Okay, thank you. Let me first thank Minister Smith, Carolina, for leading the excellent discussion earlier today on how circular economy can address climate change. I really see that the discussion built on what we achieved at the WCF plus climate. The COP negotiations on climate and biodiversity in coming months are crucial. And we must now turn the course of addressing the environmental crises we are facing. The economic opportunities for circular economy are being spoken out. We still have to strengthen the role of a circular economy as an economically viable tool to address the three crises that Inger mentioned. I'm also seeing the urgency of biodiversity loss gaining a wider understanding alongside climate and pollution, which is excellent. I'm looking forward to the keynote speech from Professor Daskupt, as many, many others are expecting this, uh, this speech in the next session. Because uh, Daskupta review earlier this year said, said it very clearly. We need to develop ways to use market mechanisms to maintain our natural capital. Finally, I think the regional and global alliances are very welcome forums to speed up the transition and to realize a circular economy. As has been in the core of WCF, collaboration across regions and sectors is, cent is central and the alliances support this collaboration.
We need a common vision for a sustainable future, but at the same time, different regions face very different opportunities and challenges in terms of circular economy. Amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's such a message that's filled with a lot of hope and a lot of um, inspiration for a lot of us. And I think what's really powerful about that is oftentimes when you talk about the environment, when you talk about changing systems, um, we often have very sort of pessimistic discussions because we talk about how difficult it is. But sort of hearing you share sort of all this energy um, that's happening globally, is, it's very exciting, it's very energizing, it's very um, encouraging. So, um, Kitos, uh, your key, um, much appreciated. So we're now gonna head back to Minister Van Weyenberg. Um, just to confirm, are we able to hear you? Can we say a little hello, hello? Uh, hi, I'll, I'm back. I hope uh, I hope it's better Perfect. now. Perfect. We can hear you <laughs> Excellent. loud and clear. So in that case, let's actually go back to our first question because we really wanted to hear your answer and your response to that first question. Um, so just to sort of repeat it once again, um, Please tell us more about the link between your ministry, the fact that your ministry hosted the WCEF plus climate in April, um, and how, climate, how circularity can be a tool for tackling climate change, right? Like that was some uh, focus in that uh, WCEF plus climate session in April. So please tell us more about that link and what's coming next in uh, the Netherlands. I think in, in the Netherlands, we, we try to follow up on the, the, the April meeting, which said as a conclusion, let's keep the drumbeat going. Uh, and we try to do that by a number of actions. For example, with UNEP, we're working on a toolkit to help countries integrate circular economy in their NDCs. But also at home, we try to improve our public procurement. As uh, Inge Andersen said, uh, that's a real uh, way where governments themselves can support the circular economy, for example, with the cement and steel industries, um, which still have a long way uh, to go. And maybe finally, we have a first international ICT pact We've launched it this summer because the information and communication technology sector has a long way to go with more repair, more reuse, and smaller footprints. So uh, we really try to follow up on the energy of the April session. I'm very grateful for uh, Citra and um, Canada for uh, uh, taking on uh, the flame and bringing it further because it's clear that it's a bit far beyond time now to create a circular economy. And uh, we really have to move from action, from words to action. And uh, uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And I hope this second chance, at least my, uh, uh, the sound was much better. Your sound was perfect. And it was worth asking again. That was, that was a wonderful response. So I'm glad we did. And um, our last question is actually for you, Mr. Uh, Van Weinberg. So you've had, many positions across your career. Um, but for those of, uh, for people who are outside the Netherlands listening, this is just your first month being Minister of the Environment um, in the Netherlands. So in sort of a one sentence answer, what did you say has surprised you the most about this new position that you have compared to your other positions? It's always very, very dangerous to ask one sentence questions <laughs> to politicians. It's not our, our main 40, but um, maybe two things. The first one is there's an incredible amount of energy yeah. uh, with consumers, producers, retailers, and how we can really implement change. For example, in the Netherlands, we're now discussing circular bicycle roads. And you know, the Netherlands, we like to cycle, um, but also circular mattresses, which now have a very big uh, footprint. So that's the positive energy. But I also found uh, a real call for policymakers and politicians like myself to really implement systematic change with taxation to really make sure that we have true pricing where both the finity of the res resources we use and the impact to the environment of production is much better reflected in the price. So with our fiscal policy, with our public procurement policy, but also with a mandatory uh, recycled content um, in goods that we use, I think we have a long way to go. So I'm very enthusiastic about all the energy, but I also feel a strong obligation for politicians to actually implement a systemic change to improve the business case mm -hmm. and make sure that the circular economy becomes the most normal thing in the world. 
Thank you, Bill. Um, I can't I believe listening to that because all I kept thinking was circular beds. <laughs> and, uh, Not that circular, kind of circular, circular bed. Circular bike rods just going in circles. <laughs> yeah. I'm Catherine. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, Mr. Van Weyenberg, congratulations and good luck in your new position. Minister Smith, thank you so much for joining us and for giving us such a wonderful um, opportunity to think forward to uh, Mr. Dasgupta. And of course, Yuki, Yuki Katainen, Thank you so much for co-hosting along with us and joining us for this panel this morning. Thank you all so, so much. We look forward to continuing to work together. And just like that, welcome to the circle of life, the circular economy in climate and biodiversity. Donc, le bien-être humain, le... Um, human well-being, our economies, and the intrinsic value of nature are more and more threatened by the fact that we are cons constantly overgoing the limits of our planet. We need a uh, great change to mitigate climate change and protect nature. I'm to welcome Professor Partha Dasgupta to set the scene for this session. Professor Dasgupta has been a professor of economics at the University of Cambridge since 1985. He will be interviewed by Citra's communication director, Alina Ravanti. Uh, for the introduction, I have to echo what you said. I'm really looking forward to our discussions. So Professor Dasgupta, a warm welcome to WCEF. Your recent uh, review on the economics for biodiversity sets out to underline how the economy depends on nature. Your review will continue to shape the discussion addressing biodiversity loss and the over-exploitation of natural resources. So, Mr. Professor, let's start from the beginning. What has led to standard models not accounting for nature, causing our relationship with nature to be so destructive? Well, that's a very hard question to answer, but let me try it out anyway. The, um, when the human economy globally was small relative to the biosphere, it probably made sense to keep nature out of economic models because the uh, attention was paid to the accumulation of physical capital and human capital. But over the past 70 years, if not more, longer, uh, the human economy has grown so fast and is now so bulky in every sense that it's now really collapsed, creating enormous stresses on the biosphere for reasons that you are familiar. And so it makes no longer any sense to keep nature out. Not only that, but it's high time you recognize that the human economy is embedded in nature, completely embedded. Everything we do uh, is dependent on nature. Uh, a circular economy reduces consumption and production and maintains the value of materials. How can transitioning to more sustainable production and consumption patterns reduce our over-exploitation of the biosphere? Well, basically speaking, the demands we make on nature's goods and services have to decline, have to be decreased, because the demand, aggregate demand far exceeds nature's capacity to supply those, make, meet those demands on a sustainable basis. So we have to reduce our demand, as well as invest in such a way as to make nature more healthy, ecosystems more healthy. And I think it's for that reason that in my review, I did not really speak to biodiversity, nor did I speak to climate change, because those are manifestations of something intrinsically wrong with our treatment of nature, the way we live. Now, when I say we, I mean, the world economy as a whole. Um, and instead, I focus on ecosystems because they are capital assets. And by ecosystems, I mean mangroves and wetlands and grasslands and so forth of various sizes and shapes and uh, spatial and temporal extent. But it's they who are supplying all the goods and services that enable us to survive and live well, those who are able to live well. And so the idea is to be able to place a value on them or 
create institutions such that when we make use of these resources, we recognize the cost that we're imposing by using it. Now, that, that, that recognition can come either through actually having to pay, or it could happen if we are really concerned through self-discipline. Some people call it conscience, all right? Not to use too much. I, as an economist, obviously regard the incentive structure more, uh, I understand it better. So I spend quite a lot of time trying to construct institutions which will be able to offer us the prices that we ought to pay and therefore we then husband our resources. Uh, the change uh, does not happen by itself. So, Mr. Professor, what can policymakers, business leaders and researchers do to address the current biodiversity crisis by increasing sustainable con consumption and production? Well, the, in my review, I raised the question or and I addressed the question from the perspective of the household, the firm, the community, the region, the nation and the global as a whole, because there is no single environmental problem. There is as many environmental problems as there are human beings on Earth. Each of us is creating it. All right. So we need to look at the problem from a variety of angles and at the local, very local level. One thing we can do is community engagement, which in some many countries is very active, are creating green spaces. And they do that with voluntary uh, labor. My wife and I ourselves give voluntary you know, time to these activities, as do so many of our people, of the people who are attending this workshop. So that's one class of problems. The other is to, of course, as citizens, we vote. We vote for public policies which give attention to, the, to nature. And if you move from the very local to the real, the, the global, uh, one thing we ought to be thinking about is the creation of an international organization like the World Bank, IMF, but not those, create a new one, which will actually be concerned with managing the global commons, like the oceans. And uh, we need to charge for our use of them. So there are many, many kinds of institutions we, need, we can think of. And finally, to address your particular question about financial uh, companies in, the, in the individual countries, I think it's extremely important. One possibility would be for companies to uh, disclose their entire supply chains because as uh, ecosystems in the tropics get eroded through excessive use uh, the risks that companies face for importing products from there go up but these risks are correlated with one another and so it's in the interest of companies in the west to actually tie their hands together collectively and seek governments uh, uh, enforcement for disclosure. Disclosure means citizens, consumers, can judge for themselves whether actually the product they're consuming meets with the ethical standards that we as citizens feel we ought to be imposing, insisting on. Uh, and the great advantage is that's one hope, and I think we should be able to exploit that, because the risks these firms are facing are very similar to the risks that the suppliers are facing, and they happen to be very poor people in Africa, Latin America, Asia. So this is one place where the interests are common between the suppliers as well as the producers. Professor, if you should put it very briefly, uh, what direct and indirect actions are most important? Well, one of them would be, again, it depends on the scale. At the local level, it could be payment for ecosystem services, which countries like Costa Rica have introduced considerably, as well as in China. At the global level, I've already given you an indication, an ins international institution. Thank you, Mr. Professor. This year indeed marks a time of change with the ongoing UN climate and biodiversity negotiation processes. And as you said, we need to rethink how we value our natural resources and biodiversity. And uh, businesses that work to improve uh, biodiversity and climate will be the winners of the future and businesses with circular business models have the opportunity to be the front runners in achieving the business opportunities from climate and biodiversity. So thank you very much, Professor Dasgupta, for your extremely valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Our next panel will focus on the role of businesses in addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. I would like to invite the moderator, my colleague from Citra, Tim Forslund, to join the stage. Hello, Tim. Hi, Elena. Wow, it's, uh, yeah, what a way to start the day. Uh, I think Professor Descupta certainly set the scene with this understanding that the, uh, everything is embedded in nature, including the human economy. And next, we will dive a little bit deeper into what this means. To be more specific, one aspect of the human economy, um, looking more at the role of businesses. But we will not only talk about the risks that businesses face, We'll also look at some of the opportunities that action on biodiversity and climate present. To begin with, conservation and the energy transition are absolutely crucial. But to fully turn the tide on biodiversity loss and the climate crisis, we need to fundamentally transform the way in which we, we manage materials in our economy. Citra has recently begun a study with Vivid Economics, which provided the analytics to the Descupta review that Professor Descupta just alluded to. In our new study, we're examining and quantifying the role that the circular economy can play in tackling uh, both halting and reversing global biodiversity loss. And uh, by rethinking how we manage materials, how we consume and produce things in a more sustainable way, as Inger Anderson just alluded to, we can um, have a big impact on both climate and biodiversity. And our initial results that you can find on our website uh, suggests that action in three areas in the food sector alone can play a big role can help halt 22% uh, of um, uh, halting and restoring biodiversity loss. And this is in form of um, tackling food loss and waste and shifting to regenerative agriculture and alternative proteins. And um, these three actions, um, they also go a really long way towards uh, tackling uh, the climate crisis. We will discuss this more tomorrow in the accelerator session, um, biodiversity as a circular business opportunity. But now I would like to invite the speakers to our next panel. First, Kathleen McLaughlin is the executive director, uh, the executive vice president of Walmart, one of the largest retailers in the world. Olivia Markham, a portfolio manager at BlackRock, a leader in circular finance. And finally, Petri Alava, CEO and co-founder of Infinite and Fiber, which has produced um, a novel way of producing fibers using only recycled content. Kathleen, starting with you, you're also the chief sustainability officer at Walmart. And it's one of the largest retailers and one of the largest companies even in the world. What is the role of the circular economy today for Walmart? And how do you see this role also in the future? Well, as so many people have already said today, uh, shifting our practice as humanity toward a circular regenerative practice instead of a take, make, dispose practice is really essential for continuation of life on the planet. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we've been working on sustainability at Walmart for a number of years. But in the in the recent times, we've elevated our ambition to become a regenerative company uh, because we can't continue to serve our customers and employ our associates and create opportunities for suppliers and support communities. In, in other words, create value for our stakeholders unless we really transform our business to be regenerative for people and planet. Um, so circularity is a big part of that. And what we're trying to do as a retailer, because we sit at the crossroads of customers who are buying food and apparel and things for their homes and the suppliers 
who lead the supply chains that make those products and package them and so on, we can play a special role in helping to accelerate a shift towards circularity. And um, what I would say right now in terms of the industry, the retail sector writ large, consumer products, food systems, and so on, um, we're early stages in that shift. So there's been tremendous focus in the last 10 years on eliminating waste, which is a really important part of the equation. We shouldn't underestimate that. And significant work underway. For example, um, operational waste, we've diverted uh, over 80% of our operational waste uh, to date, and we're trying to get to 100. Um, packaging, we're at 62% reusable, recyclable, compostable packaging in our private brand and so on. Um, but that's just a first step where we need to get is towards circularity. And there are many, many pilots underway with reuse refill models in packaging, um, reuse of materials. So taking shrink wrap and recycling it into you know, future packaging, things like that. And of course, food waste, taking what could have been wasted food and repurposing that either in other forms of food for human consumption or other uses. Um, but I would say those are early stages, and we'll hear from some other panelists about what's happening in apparel and fibers and things like that. Um, what we really need to get to is making that the norm for products and packaging and then regenerating materials as well. And again, we'll, we'll hear in a bit about fibers and how that can be done. So um, it's early days. We have to go faster. Uh, we're trying to do that through um, a series of things that perhaps we'll get um, we'll have time to get into, but, but that's uh, where we are today. Thank you, Kathleen, and I think you just provided an excellent segue here to our next uh, speaker that I would like to hear from. Um, Petri Alava, uh, you're from the textiles sector that uh, Kathleen just mentioned, and Infinited Fiber was just mentioned as one of the 41 leading, um, well, most interesting circular economy companies from Finland, and you can find all the other 40 companies on Citrus website. But Petri, um, I'd be delighted to hear from you. I think, um, I mean, we now heard from a global corporate, a really, really large retailer. Uh, and your company is very different from Walmart. You are a small but a very fast scaling company. What role does the circular economy, what role do you play in the transition toward a circular economy? And how does this link to biodiversity and climate? Yeah, let, let me first uh, explain what we do. Uh, so first of all, Infinite Fiber Company is a, a fashion and textile industry uh, a technology company. Uh, and our technology enables using different kind of waste streams, like, uh, for example, textile waste. Uh, what we do, uh, first, we are mechanically shredding the material apart, removing the hard parts like uh, zippers and buttons. And then with the help of responsible chemistry, uh, we are cleaning the material, capturing the cellulose. And then at the molecular level, we are breaking down the cellulose into liquid. And from liquid cellulose, we are then regenerating a brand new fiber, uh, which uh, looks and feels uh, natural, natural and soft like, like uh, virgin cotton. Uh, and we call this fiber Infina, uh, which then can be used in ordinary clothing, like, for example, this, this shirt this is made 100% of our fiber, T-shirts, sweaters, or jeans. Uh, and what is then our role in, in circularity? Uh, as we are a technology company, we definitely feel that we are an enabler of, of circularity in, in, in textile and fashion industry. And our technology enables creating a premium quality fiber, 100% uh, regenerated, 100% made up of textile waste, and being a true alternative for, for, for virgin cotton. So nothing new needs to be grown or, 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 or harvested uh, to create Infina fiber. We also make it very easy for consumers. Um, as from, from the quality perspective, consumers don't need to be making any compromise. This, this shirt is feeling exactly the same as us made 100% from, from virgin cotton. Uh, and also we don't set any, any limitations to the design. Uh, how, how we then, how this all links then to the biodiversity and, and climate. Uh, so let me give a few examples. So the, when you are growing uh, cotton, which is the second most common material in textiles manufacturing, you need, a, need to be using vast amounts of, of land and water. Uh, polyester, which is the most common material, is made from, from oil. 
Uh, and when you are producing, uh, say, ordinary viscose, you need to be felling the trees in order to produce the fiber. So uh, Infinice is created out of, of textiles or textile waste, which it already exists. Uh, so no, no need of, of, of new farmlands, uh, no need of, of drilling oil, no need to, to, to fall the, the, the forests. Uh, and uh, then we also enable to, to keep the biomass in circulation longer. Uh, which means that there there's actually no escape of of, uh, of methane or, or CO2 uh, as what happens today uh, when when you are incinerating or 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 landfilling the textile waste, which is the kind of most common way of, of getting rid of waste today. Oh, thank you, Petri. I think this gives a very nice background into what exciting things you are working at um, at Infinite Fiber here in Finland. Um, Olivia, we've now heard from uh, two quite different companies, I dare say. And uh, if we think of, of BlackRock, you've really taken circular economy to the next level, I think it's, it's fair to say. And you had the first fund that really focused on the circular economy, and it's now one of the largest ones as well. And when you introduced this as a theme, what was your, your thinking? Could you tell us a little bit how you invest into the circular economy as a theme? Sure, thank you very much. Look, from my perspective, um, you know, the circular economy is a really exciting uh, and rapidly growing theme and, and definitely an area uh, that should be attracting investors' attention. Um, you know, I would say you know, if we, we kind of look back five years ago amongst the investment community, this isn't an area that was A, particularly well understood and B, particularly focused on. If you fast forward it to today, you're now seeing that the circular economy is a key component of government stimulus packages. It's linked to low cost financing and green bonds. It's tied to regulation. And it's also starting to become quite a core part of corporate strategy. Now, something that's quite unique uh, to our fund is that we've been able to partner with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on this fund, uh, who acts as our knowledge partner and gives us great insights into emerging themes and trends in this space. Um, ahead of launching the fund, you know, given this was you know, quite a nascent area for a lot of us, uh, we spent a lot of time analysing what the circular economy actually means for every industry globally and what are the opportunities and, and implications along the supply chain that arise from it. This allowed us to define, define a universe of stocks and the way that we've looked to sort of, I guess, categorise this universe is that we've broken it down into three different categories. So we're looking to invest in companies that are adopters of circular economy principles, so Walmart would be a good example here, enablers of the shift, like Infinite uh, Fibre, and then finally, beneficiaries of the thing. Thanks, Olivia. I think that provides for a very nice introduction into what you, you do, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more going, going on behind the scenes. Um, Petri, going back to, to you at Infinite Fibre, I think there are many reasons why it's important to talk about the, the textile sector. It's um, one of the sectors that has big impacts both on biodiversity loss and climate change. And um, in the circular economy, when we think of um, the solutions provided there, it's both in terms of um, well, keeping materials in use for as long as possible uh, before we, at the end of the day, recycle things. Um, but your solution, I think, takes a slightly different, different approach. So it would be really interesting to hear uh, from your perspective, how does recycling compare to other circular business models like um, sharing or repairing, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, we're great fans that that all models are needed to to fix the situation. Uh, of course, it makes real sense to to produce more and more lasting uh, garments and fashion, uh, and the new business models like um, textiles rentals or 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 brands uh, take back systems, purpose to fi refix or, or resell the textiles are, are just they're great and, and they are all important to to right direction. 
but looking beyond the repair and reuse. Uh, so if you look today, 80% uh, of, of textile waste globally, which means one truckload per every second goes to incineration or landfilling. Uh, then some of, of the collected waste goes to down, downcycling, like uh, uh, producing incin uh, insulation materials, and only 1% goes back to new textiles. So the, that's where our, our kind of, of technologies are, are really presenting the solution. Uh, and I wouldn't really compare because so all of, of these solutions are serving for, for the purpose. Uh, and, and we are just great, great believers that textile to textile regeneration technologies, they, they have a significant uh, part to play. Uh, as as uh, we are not, not letting textiles go to waste and, and, and we are, let's say, limiting also the burden on, on virgin resources. defining what it means with with recycling and i think this infinite fiber i mean it, it looks like you have um really interesting um fabrics that you produce uh, regardless uh, i think going back to you kathleen um i have a double question uh, for you so please please bear with me here uh, firstly you mentioned that you're a regenerative company uh, just for the, the benefit of our viewers i think i'd be curious to hear what does that actually mean is this just regenerative agriculture or does this imply because you mentioned um that you also yeah, use reuse models refill and you, you tackle tackle waste as well so how does this where does this sit within your your uh, your work and then secondly where do you see the largest opportunities for for walmart this is such a such a huge huge field yeah. well so um first let me clarify i said we have set a goal to become a regenerative company and goodness there's a long way to go between where we are today and what that would mean and for us it's a broad definition it includes for people and for planet and as others have said it's about restoring renewing replenishing so going from a mentality that says let's be sustainable and hold things the way they are, do no harm, minimize footprint to a positive um, rebuilding, renewing, restoring mentality. And it's about people as well as, um, as planet. So um, the agenda includes everything from using retail jobs as a springboard for upskilling and upward mobility advancement to human rights and supply chains, to digital citizenship, to what we're talking about today. So it's a broad aspiration. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the synergies between climate and biodiversity and circularity. Uh, they're, they're tremendous. And it's one of the reasons that we uh, created a platform a few years ago as part of our science-based targets for emissions reduction and our drive to get to zero emissions in our operations by 2040. Um, we created a platform for scope three. Uh, because in a retailer like Walmart, Scope 3, it, it covers a lot of territory. It's everything from food to apparel to electronics to you name it, to a wide range of products. And um, that initiative, Project Gigaton, now has 3,100 suppliers participating across categories. I think it's one of the largest private sector collective action efforts to initially it was about getting to a billion tons metric tons of emissions avoided by 2030 as part of our scope three targets for emissions but the way we've set it up is practical actions and support in six arenas including energy packaging waste food waste textile waste you know all kinds of all manner of waste product design which includes for circularity regenerative agriculture and forest management conservation restoration and so what we've done is work with a number of uh, leading NGOs, including Ellen MacArthur, we work closely with them to create what we call calculators that translate practical changes that businesses can make on farms, in factories, in fields, in transportation, in packaging, in product design, right the way through to consumer use to um, make progress in each of those arenas, certainly for emissions, but now also for nature and for circularity. And so we support those initiatives with a whole variety of tools, including things like um, we funded Systemic who worked very closely with Ocean Conservancy around breaking the wave of plastic waste to create a tool called Plastic IQ that anyone can use. It's publicly available, but it's um, really for companies that have plastic to get out of it 
reduce it or substitute or move to reuse, refill, or still use plastic if that's the only solution, but in a way that's totally reusable, recoverable, recyclable. So that's just one example. And, and you know, the message I'd like to give today is the role that every single company, every single business can play in interrogating their products, their services, their operating model to consider how to rewire it for a regenerative outcome. And what are the practical steps that may seem small, but when they add up together, it really comes to a culture shift. And that's what we're going to need to do this as a society. We need everybody to reframe the way they're considering material usage not only for eliminating waste, but circularity and regeneration back at, uh, at source in terms of ecosystems. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I think um, this certainly goes beyond regenerative agriculture than this, this ambition. And I think it also resonates with when we talk about biodiversity, that we don't just want to halt biodiversity loss. We want to reverse and have a positive, positive impacts as well. And you mentioned uh, the role of science-based targets. And I would just like to mention that in tomorrow's accelerator session uh, on biodiversity as a circular business opportunity, uh, we'll have a speaker from the Science-Based Targets Network talk to uh, the role of of, um, the science-based targets for na nature, which is a new uh, science-based targets uh, framework that looks at uh, biodiversity as, as well. Um, going back to you, Olivia, um, I'm thinking that you said that, well, it, it, circular economy has certainly come a long way and, and, and it's reaching more more areas. There are green bonds that that, that, that account for this, and and it's it's come a long way. But it's also at quite an early stage. I think it's fair fair to say, and mm -hmm. companies are at quite different um, parts of their different stages of their journey. And some of the companies in your portfolio, you mentioned, you have the WalMarts of of this world, and you have the uh, so you mentioned adopters and enablers. Um, but o overall, when you, when you try and decide on the ones that you include what's what's the, um, the the measurement that you use to assess a company's exposure to the circular economy could you tell us a little bit more about that yeah i mean you're absolutely right um you know it's a circular economy amongst investors is still a nascent theme and while there's a lot of data out there there's no sort of consistent set of reporting that companies use um, and I'm sure that'll come in time. Um, for us, that means this is quite a lot of work that's required to understand what a company's exposure to the circular economy actually is, uh, and also whether or not it's meaningful within its industry. So the way that we look um, to measure a company's exposure to the circular economy is via its revenue exposure. Now, across our portfolio, we have on average greater than 50% revenue exposure to the circular economy. Uh, but probably the hardest area, which I think you somewhat alluded to, um, is how we imagine how we measure circularity within our sort of adopters bucket. And these are a number of the big sort of FMCG groups and, and some of the tech companies. So what we do here is we look at companies' targets or the commitments that they've made to make their businesses more circular in the future. So this is areas like looking at their targets around the use of recycled the use of sustainable fibres and just like broad-based elimination of waste out of their business. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here and I would like to go back to Kathleen. I think we've heard, uh, for instance, from uh, in yesterday's session on, on circularity at home, like there, there are so many different stages of um, um, the value chain of different actors in society. And I think Walmart is, is really interesting from this point of view that you really sit at the center between producer, consumers and so many different actors. So how do you see your role in, in, in really kind of supporting the transition to a circle, circular economy at this nexus that you find yourself in? So we do think we can play a special role in encouraging suppliers and customers to transition habits and ways of producing products and ways of consuming products in favor of circularity and ultimately regeneration. Um, it is a broad system change, so I don't want to overstate the impact that we can have. We're just one actor in what is an incredibly complex system when it comes to something like food production, consumption, apparel, and what have you. But what we do try to do is um, align with the scientists who, um, you know, for example, you talked about science based targets for um, climate and certainly for nature, folks like EMF um, and others 
on what is best practice uh, or what's needed. And then to work, for example, with suppliers, not only to encourage them to cut targets, so we spend a lot of our time making the business case, why should a supplier um, shift its practices towards circularity, for example, and then providing supporting uh, tools. And sometimes those are directly for our suppliers in coaching sessions, working with them through different use cases of packaging, for example, or product design, working with them on food waste, there are a number of mechanisms in place to do that. Um, for example, World Resources Institute has initiatives to help suppliers engage their suppliers and engage their suppliers to eliminate food waste, um, you know, as one example. So there are numerous initiatives like that where we work in hand in hand to help build capability and then invest in tools that people can use at different stages of you know, production. And then similarly with customers trying to shift the mindset and encourage things like take back. So for example, um, we're in the middle now of figuring out what we do with plastic bags. So in some markets like Mexico, we've outright eliminated, eliminated them. In other places, we're encouraging take back into our stores and we're taking the bags and recycling them and repurposing them. So you know the solutions can vary um, depending on the local context. So it's a lot about goal setting, climate and culture, um, and then tools and capability in development. We also do um, investment through Walmart Foundation uh, in enablers for the whole system. I talked about Plastic IQ as an example tool that we funded through Walmart giving, you know, things like that, um, that can be useful for the industry as a whole. Um, and, you know, as I said before, we're really trying to get across this notion of the synergy between climate action action for nature and circularity and regeneration when it comes to materials. Those go hand in hand and try to make it practical and, and, and really facilitate that shift at scale. Thanks a lot, uh, Kathleen. I think you really speak both to the scale and the scope of the, the, the opportunity here. And Inger Anderson also talked about the, the importance of these interlinkages. So I think that resonates with me at least. Uh, and I would like to thank all, all three of you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, uh, Petri. It's been a great uh, pleasure to talk to the three of you. And thanks a lot for sharing your insights here. I hope this has brought home the message that um, uh, biodiversity and climate, uh, this can be a real business opportunity and circular economy can really be at the heart of those actions. Now on your screen, uh, you should be seeing a notification for a word cloud question that I hope you'll answer. What circular economy practice is the most relevant to achieve climate and biodiversity goals? If you could provide a one or at most two word uh, reply to that, and we will show show the world word cloud on the screen. Uh, Let me repeat that in English. What is the practice of uh, circular economy that seems to be the most uh, relevant uh, when trying to uh, reach the, our goals of biodiversity and climate? Uh, please submit one or two words in uh, response to this question, and we'll uh, display your answers. I think the answers are slowly coming in. And fortunately, I can't see them myself uh, right here. So I will just skip ahead and uh, yeah, um, continue from here, uh, continuing from here. Um, tomorrow we'll have the discussion on biodiversity as a circular business opportunity, but we will now turn our eyes to uh, policy making and the global goals for climate and biodiversity. I'm very pleased to pass things over to our Canadian co-host, the Deputy Minister for Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, Christine Hogan. Bonne continuation. Vous avez la parole. You have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Tim. Thank you very much, Tim. Ça marche bien, le, le technologie aujourd'hui. Is this technology working well now? It's great to uh, have this opportunity uh, this morning to um, moderate uh, what I think is going to be a very, very intriguing and interesting panel. Um, the coming months uh, will be uh, bring important discussions on climate and biodiversity. And I'm pleased to be joined today by a very distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, to discuss what pol policymakers can do to address climate and biodiversity in the context of the circular economy. So joining me today 
the Right Honourable uh, Lord Goldsmith, the United Kingdom's uh, Minister for the Pacific and the Environment, uh, Executive Secretary for the Convention on Biological Diversity, Elizabeth Marima, Costa Rica's Vice Minister for Energy, Rolando Castro Cordoba, and President of the Inuit Tepiri, Tep Tepirit uh, Kanatami um, Nathan Obed, and for our international viewers, uh, the ITK or the uh, Inuit uh, Tapirit Katatami uh, is the national organization representing Inuit in Canada. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, it's part of the charm of this incredible forum that uh, that uh, things happen apace. So I'm going to uh, dive right in. Welcome to all of my uh, panelists this morning, and um, I really hope that uh, that we have a very invigorating uh, discussion. Let me start with uh, Ms. Uh, Marima um, and uh, listening to the discussions uh, from this morning. I uh, would be very interested in hearing what your main takeaways are on the potential of the circular economy in harnessing the interlinkages of climate and biodiversity. Can you give a concrete example of what exactly the role of a circular economy is in supporting biodiversity? Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And the question already answered by the previous speakers, and for me, really delighted uh, to have listened to all the tangible examples of what business is already doing uh, in terms of circular economy and harnessing nature. Indeed, we need circular economy that is carbon neutral in a nature-based approach, as it is also regenerative. In other words, it is not enough just to be secular. It has to be part of the entire metabolism. The services and dependencies on nature to business and finance need to be integrated into business and finance plans to be able to bend the curve of nature loss. and need to be part of every decision, operation code, as well as standards of our businesses and finance policies and programs. Solutions need to be integrated because tackling carbon and nature loss is done along with pollution control as well as restoration of land and sea. And therefore reversing the impacts of incentives of nature is the most actionable element. And basically we hope our economies will continue to invest away from destroying nature and therefore bringing natural capital into uh, uh, protection. We need to start with metrics. How will we measure the improvements? Economic progress that incorporates nature, positive incentives that work in the market. Then we need to build the capacity that might be the biggest, one of the biggest challenges. How to prepare the decision makers, both in public and private sector, in finance and in business, particularly in developing countries, which we know today investments in depleting natural capital uh, are still there to be able to set them up into smart nature-friendly goals and targets. As you may be aware, we are in the process of the development of the global biodiversity framework uh, under the convention, which will guide the, the world in the next years, 10 years and beyond to be adopted at our next conference of the parties uh, next year in April, May. And this framework, the first draft, which was discussed two weeks ago, already proposes integrated solutions for food, water, health, infrastructure, and infrastructure. For instance, if we help our youth in urban centers using distributed uh, innovative applications to find business and information solutions to consume mostly locally and sustainable produce or organic foods using local varieties in mixed cultures, then we'll succeed hopefully to protect wetlands and forests that accumulate carbon while protecting biodiversity. If we can ensure no pesticides, 
are used that affect uh, affect pollinators, then we preserve traditional varieties. We assure jobs and investments and generate returns for greener loans, credits, and risk taken. And lastly, if we incorporate nature into urban transportation or energy infrastructure as Singapore already does, we can reduce the extreme temperatures and risks of droughts and floods. And in that case, we increase immunity for local residents and offer recreational enterprise opportunities for the rural youth. It's a win-win option that we need first and foremost, and the impetus gained there will guide movement also on the issues that will need deeper changes that will require to be truly rewiring our economies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very rich uh, response to that question. And, um, and I, I liked your reference at the end to win-win, uh, which is, I think, uh, what a lot of us uh, have on their minds here. Let me turn now to uh, Lord Goldsmith. Um, having listened to uh, some of the discussions uh, that preceded us this morning, Maybe you could uh, offer some reflections, some ideas, some key messages on uh, why biodiversity and nature are critical in delivering climate action. Yeah, th thank you very much. And thanks for having me um, uh, today. Uh, there's no doubt, uh, and I don't think anyone does doubt now, that we're putting the natural world under really impossible, intolerable pressure. And it's worth considering without rehearsing all the figures that we're losing still around 30 football pitches worth of forest every single minute, that a million species face extinction. And just as quickly as we're stripping the ocean of life, we're filling it with trash, with plastic, just as quickly. And all of this against the backdrop of climate change. So it, 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 there is a temptation among some, I think, to see it as a, an ecological tragedy for sure, but one that's essentially separate from us humans. But we know that that couldn't be further from the truth. Half a billion small farms already tackling, having to cope with diminishing yields as a consequence of poor land use. A billion people depend on forests for their survival and their livelihood. Similar number in relation to fish. And we know, of course, that even the most conservative estimates around climate change are going to be devastating for all of us, but particularly the world's poorest people. So we've got a lot of work to do. And the good news, I think, is that we know what we need to do. Put simply, there is there is no credible pathway to tackling climate change, to staying within one and a half degrees, uh, to, to, to hitting net zero that does not involve protecting and restoring nature on a massive scale. And nature-based solutions like mangroves, forests, and so on could provide around a third of the most cost-effective solution to climate change, as well as helping us deal with a whole range of other issues as well, hunger, poverty, pollution, even pandemics. Uh, the, the, the problem is that nature-based solutions currently are not really recognized. They get about 3% of the world's climate finance at the moment. So as COP presidents, if there's one thing we're going to change, it's it's that ratio. We, we need to put nature at the heart of our response to climate change and indeed a whole range of other issues. And that means finance, public and private. It means governments using those levers that only governments control to change the incentives. It means fundamentally forcing the market to recognize that the value of nature, of ecosystems, are things that we all fundamentally depend on, while also attaching a cost to their destruction. There's an enormous amount of work to do, but it does feel now like finally the discussion has opened and nature is going higher and higher up the agenda. Let's hope it's not too late. <coughs> Maybe I can just uh, ask you, I know the UK uh, is holding the presidency of COP26 um, this year. And uh, how how is the United Kingdom looking at the interlinkages between climate and nature in, in the context of the upcoming summit? Yeah, it's look, we, we are doing everything we can to put nature at the heart of COP26 uh, and to create as many linkages as possible between COP26 and the CBD, uh, which, which is being hosted by China in Kunming. We, we know that if we're serious about uh, mitigating climate change or adapting to climate change and staying within that one and a half degrees, that we're going to have to change the way we use and change the way we look after land and water and the ecosystems and biodiversity that we all depend on. So at COP, we want to see a step change in global action to bend that curve that's just been described. We, we are uh, 
securing finance commitments from donor countries, but also from the private sector. Uh, we need agreement around really amb ambitious stretching targets, uh, combined with the mechanisms for holding governments to account to those targets and commitments. And we need, I think, above all, to tackle the, the drivers of nature this, uh, degradation, particularly deforestation. So with two streams of activity that we're really focusing on is number one, building a coalition of countries committed to identifying and shifting those land use subsidies that are driving destruction. If you consider that the top 50 food producing countries spend around $700 billion a year subsidizing often destructive land use, that's got to change. And if we do change that, we could flip the market. And the second stream of activities is an attempt to, again, build an alliance of producer and consumer countries, forest countries and non-forest countries, uh, to break the link between commodity production and deforestation. Commodity production is responsible for most of the deforestation that's happening. You can't tackle climate change without tackling deforestation. So we've got a lot of focus, big events at the World Leaders Summit, but also days devoted to uh, focusing on this issue. And, and I think, although we won't know until it happens, I think that, that we are in a good place to secure some really meaningful um, commitments on this issue. Great, thank you for that. Um, maybe let me bring in um, Vice Minister Castro Cordoba into our uh, into our discussion and ask uh, you, Vice Minister, if you can uh, talk about the potential of a circular economy for climate and biodiversity in uh, in the context of uh, Costa Rica. Thank you, Vice Minister, and and thank you for inviting us to this um, important panel. Uh, yes, I think a circular economy can help us align the different policies and approaches that the country has taken uh, for many years. Uh, for instance, I think it's, it's, it has a great potential in the moment we're living and the discussions that we're having, as the prior speaker said, uh, towards uh, COP26. Um, as, as you probably know, Costa Rica launched a national decarbonization plan in 2019. And the, the approach is to have a decarbonized economy by 2050. But uh, we also have to take into account that Costa Rica is in a very vulnerable area uh, to climate change. The, the Central America is, is one of the most uh, vulnerable areas in the world. And even though our emissions are low, we need to be more resilient to climate change. And this is why Costa Rica is one of the countries that is also promoting uh, nature-based solutions. And um, so our approach is also to change uh, the way we see biodiversity because our countries, especially in the South, are more, uh, you know, um, we provide uh, natural resources to the industrialized world. And uh, we want to see biodiversity in a non-extractivist manner. Um, uh, I think we can uh, uh, benefit from biodiversity, recognize the different um, services that biodiversity provides, and with this create a new economy uh, that can create also a green jobs, quality jobs, and, and uh, at the same time, uh, let us adapt better to climate change. So this is why we think a circular economy uh, can help us go there, uh, integrate biodiversity, um, but also the climate change approaches we are taking and uh, create this new um, economy that can be resilient, but can also uh, take advantage of our um, competitive advantages, such as biodiversity. Um, we have created a, a number of important policies as I was speaking to the, um, the National Decarbonization Plan, but we also have other uh, important policies like the National Strategy on Bioeconomy and uh, the NDC that Costa Rica uh, just uh, presented was very based on our decarbonization plan, but also in the approaches of um, um, nature-based solutions. 
And also we have uh, NAMAS in very important sectors such as uh, coffee and cattle that are really uh, based of our economy. So we think a uh, circular economy uh, will help us integrate all these different approaches, all these different policies that the country has taken and um, use it as a, as a catalyzer to uh, have a, a, a new economy that will be decarbonized, that will be a resilience to climate change, but also will create green and uh, quality jobs for our people. Great. Thank you so much. It's uh, interesting to hear the perspective of uh, Central America and Costa Rica in this, uh, in this really important uh, discussion that we're having. Now going to um, turn to President Obed, Nathan. Um, very uh, keen to hear your perspective on, uh, on this session and the panel and the issues that we're discussing, um, climate and biodiversity. Much of the conversation so far is, is focused on the economic impacts of climate and bi biodiversity. So I'm wondering how, how, uh, how from your perspective you see these, uh, these issues. Well, first, I think of the term circular economy, and I think of Inuit society and culture being rooted in that definition, even if we haven't used that particular name. Uh, we use our renewable resources, we share within our community. Uh, our lifestyle uh, is connected to all living things within the environment and care for those things. Uh, I think about uh, uh, traditionally, Inuit uh, ensuring that the animals in which we harvested actually had healthy populations and would sometimes call animals who were obviously sick, who would then uh, hurt, hurt the biodiversity and the, and the uh, health of, of the, the larger environment or the larger group. So it wasn't as if we were just letting things happen to us. We also had a very positive and supportive role to play within our natural environment. So when I think about the circular economy, I think that you can't take it away from uh, the place in which the uh, business operates, the way in which um, natural resources are, ex are extracted, the way in which um, you know uh, products come to market. These are happening in places in the world. And you, you can't ever detach the local uh, nature of an understanding of a circular economy. And that I think is, is something that I uh, haven't heard a lot about uh, today, even if there are local initiatives uh, for global corporations or uh, local considerations for natural resource extraction. Uh, that's a totally different concept than actually having it, uh, your the way in which you operate grounded within the place you are in the world. I also think about the Arctic and the changing Arctic. Uh, um, even though we have these massive uh, spaces within our homeland, Inuit Nunagat, a third of Canada's landmass, um, over half of Canada's coastline, uh, our uh, uh, warming rate is two to three times the global average. And, and also we have emerging um, crises, especially in relation to things like uh, microplastics in our, in our oceans. And we need uh, the, the global community to start understanding how to create public policy or legislation or um, programs and services that are considerate of the Arctic. Uh, we've had that challenge from the, uh, the very start of industrialization. And that is going to be one of the uh, key responses, I think, um, to help the entire globe is how to understand how to do the least amount of damage to the Arctic. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, a future where our, our entire landscape changes. And um, many of the Arctic species uh, will not be able to survive and will be replaced um, within our natural environment if we do not act. That's just talking about um, the things that live within the environment. 
the actual climate and the ice the, um, uh, and the way in which uh, the Arctic is a regulator of climate across the globe, um, that has much more dire consequences for everyone on this earth. And I do hope that within these conversations, uh, that that can always be at the forefront of people's imagination, that we need to work not only in our hometowns, in our home communities, and in our home nation states, but also for the consideration of what is uh, most, uh, what are the most pressing issues globally and the places where we need to invest our time and energy. Thank you very much. That's uh, very important to hear the, the perspective. Um, so, Part of the challenge of, of uh, this day is that the agenda is jam packed. So we have uh, time for just uh, what I call a, a quick um, once around the virtual table to uh, to ask uh, all of you to respond to um, the same the same question. Um, and uh, maybe we can start with um, with you, uh, Minister Cordoba. Um, what? Uh, what are your expectations for, say, the next five years? How do you see the coming five years? And where and can where can and should the circular community, uh, those listening in today, uh, focus their their efforts and take action? Minister Cordoba. Yes, um, I think uh, we hope that our economies will transform, especially like Latin America and the Caribbean from extractive economies to a more circular economies. Um, I think for Costa Rica, it is also important that we just join the OECD. And I think um, circular economy can help us comply with the challenges of being a member of this, of this forum. Um, I think also can bring new opportunities if also the markets will start recognizing the circular economy and the products that are coming out of circular economies and, 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 and recognize that with uh, you know, uh, certifications or, or, or other incentives, better, better prices. And I think this will open the great opportunities for economies like ours. Uh, I think also we need to work together in, uh, inside our countries uh, with the private sector and the local governments, and we are trying to do so. But also we are uh, hoping to have a regional approach. And this is why Costa Rica is one of the leaders of the regional coalition of circular economy, because uh, among the countries in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean, we can work together and exchange better practices, but also uh, access uh, you know, more strict markets. So we think uh, the next five years will be key in terms not only about um, circular economy, but also about uh, the discussions on biodiversity, the link between biodiversity, conservation, nature-based solutions, and the climate change challenges that the world is facing. And, but also I think um, circular economy will be key also for the post pandemic recovery of our economies. Okay, great. Let me turn now to uh, Nitan Obed and, uh, and your take on, uh, on how you see the next five years and particularly some practical words for, uh, for our audience today. Yeah, Inuit advocate for a collaborative approach with governments and partners on all the things that we're trying to do, whether in economic development or uh, reduce uh, our, our, car our carbon emissions or develop priorities and um, to work on these ideas such as a circular economy. I would imagine that it, uh, um, Indigenous people globally would want that collaborative approach as well with governments and partners. Also, for Inuit specifically, uh, we need to engage our communities, um, universities, research institutes, uh, industry, the international community uh, as partners in a scientific process to understand the changes in, in the uh, Arctic and how they may affect um, global climate change but also then to understand how to be inclusive of Inuit 
in a circular economy in a way that um, you know it had not been inclusive in uh, other national or international efforts in relation to economic development. Great, Ms. Marima, thoughts from from you? Some some uh, uh, closing comments on this panel? Yes, thank you. Clearly, we need to move towards integrated solutions and really be willing to fundamentally change the way decisions are taken related to finance, production and consumption across a range of options and crossing also public-private bridge and all levels of governance from local to government. Clearly, the discussion has underlined that problems and solutions for climate change, biodiversity loss, and I will add land sea management or poverty eradication are all part of the holistic approach for which green circular economy will be a solution. So we really fundamentally need to redirect the decisions behind the entire economy. The concepts of circular economy, as well as, uh, for instance, ecological civilization or natural capital, nature-based solutions, which the minister Zach has referred to, or even creator economy being proposed by innovators and designers of information technology, or artificial intelligence, all these are components of the solutions we need, but need to be redirected, uh, really decisions in an integrated way. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, now I'll uh, ask Lord Goldsmith to uh, to reflect uh, and, uh, and share a few um, action-oriented comments before we conclude. Thank you so much, and, and, and I very much agree with, with what has already been said. But really, in five years' time, uh, we, governments will have had to have stepped up by then. Uh, there's really no, no excuse uh, for not stepping up. That means finance, it means commitments, it means policies, all collectively matching the scale of the crisis. But we also need systemic change. We, we've seen progress with businesses identifying their carbon footprints. Growing numbers of them are committing to net zero, many of them before governments. But we're not seeing that with nature yet. And that really has to change for us. We need businesses to make the commitment to go to get deforestation out of their supply chains, to go nature positive, we need the same commitments from the big multilateral development banks. And of course, we need government decisions to be made with nature in mind. So a lot's going to have to happen in the next five years if we want to maximize the chance to, as, as others have said, bend that curve of destruction. And finally, we needed to, and again, governments do have a huge role to play here. We need to force a shift towards a more circular economy. Uh, resource extraction and processing contributes around half of total greenhouse gas emissions globally. Uh, and, and we think around 90% of biodiversity loss is caused through that process. Uh, and the trend is going up, not down, despite everything that's happened that we know. Globally, we extract around three times what um, the resources from nature than we did in 1970. And that's set to double by 2060. And we can't allow that to happen. So the shift towards a more circular economy is absolutely critical. And that makes the work that you do uh, all the more important. So I just want to thank you and thank our Canadian friends, Citra and everyone else on this eminent panel uh, for the work they're doing and the leadership they're showing. We look forward to working with you in the weeks, months and years to come. Great. Well, that uh, unfortunately brings us to the end of our, of our time. I, I really want to thank our, our panelists very sincerely for a very fruitful discussion, very engaging, very energetic, uh, and also practical, um, because I think uh, there's a degree of practicality that uh, needs to come into these conversations if we're to uh, really get on the path that we all aspire to. Um, so thank you all very much, uh, Lord Goldsmith, Ms. Marima, uh, Minister Castro and uh, President Obed for your participation. And with that, I will turn it back to the Citra studio where Mary Panzer, the Director of Sustainability Solutions, will share her key takeaways on today's discussion. Thank you and merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for the excellent panel discussion. So this session truly was interesting and there clearly is a way forward. And after listening to our excellent speakers, I would like to highlight three messages. Firstly, the triple ecological crisis is not just an ecological crisis. 
our well-being and our economies are also at risk as we keep over-exploiting resources, heating up the planet and losing biodiversity. Secondly, ecological challenges must be tackled together with joint efforts from businesses and decision makers, accounting for insights from indigenous communities, researchers, grassroots movements and also other stakeholders. This really is an all hands on deck situation and we all have an important role to play. Thirdly, we have to acknowledge that climate and biodiversity are interlinked and we must address the root causes like unsustainable production and consumption, linear economic model and our concept of well-being and happiness. According to science, we can, in fact, live good life in balance with our planet. So, dear friends, this is an important year for climate and biodiversity. This means that it is also a very important year for the most powerful solution, the circular economy. So, thank you so much for taking part in this session. Thanks very much, Mary. Uh, I'm uh, eager uh, to continue with our discussions, and I would like uh, everybody to come back and join us later. Uh, uh. That message of sharing and opening and collaborating and really not having these things live in isolation, that everything is contended with in a more circular and connected way. This particular session really highlights the need to break down some of that and to work together on climate, biodiversity, and circular economy communities. As Mari mentioned, getting that message out is a huge part of this work, and it's something that uh, one of our guests coming up next really has a lot of leadership in. So coming up next on the agenda, communicating circularity, getting the message right. A bientôt.